Okay. So uh, as I as you said, offshore resource blessings as opposed to resource curse. Uh, water as the host of God's gifts in the West Asia, North Africa, or Wana region. Uh, and um, so I'm going to be using water not as a, uh, a source on land, but also uh, value and, and God's gifts offshore or in waterways. Uh, I'll be breaking this down into four topic areas. First of all, the political economy of sectarianism and coexistence to show that uh, when we use a economic and uh, industrial approach to relationships, we can understand sectarianism and coexistence better than the Abrahamic perspective. And I think we've heard a lot about that today, also seen from a materialist uh, point of view. And that's something that's probably counterintuitive. Second, third is then the, uh, the issue of the relationship between state uh, politics uh, civil society uh, and business, and what does religion have to do with that or faith? And finally, I'll be giving you some concrete examples of how we can turn the resource curse into a resource blessing. Uh, so what is political economy? Political economy linked to the Abrahamic approach. Uh, as we see, um, Plato is pointing up the idealist approach, whereas Aristotle is pointing down or pushing down the materialist approach. Uh, I'm going to be showing how the two interact with each other, the base and the superstructure dialogue or the so-called base superstructure dialectic and how you can't understand our region without looking at both. Uh, what is the Abrahamic approach? What is Abraham? Why is Abraham so important? Well, he's the father of all three of our faiths in this region. Uh, but this approach also shows that faith is necessary to understand research and activism. So I'm using the assumption that Faith is a research asset. And finally, if we don't do the actual research, uh, we cannot understand why there is injustice, why there is uh, abuse of God's creation. Uh, and uh, as uh, Hilda Kamada uh, famously said, we have to ask why people are poor or why the environment is being destroyed. And then we might obviously get some blowback for doing that, uh, as we saw in the case of Jordan. Uh, here's a nice example of a, just a, a diagram that I found online. And we'll be talking about Abraham. Abraham is asked to give up his property, which is the base, and his nation and family, which is the superstructure. So here we see the dialectic in the story of Abraham as well. Uh, this is a little poster that I made myself, and it brings us <laughs> to water. Uh, we all know the famous uh, saying that, that is attributed to Lao, Lao Tse, which he apparently never actually said or wrote, uh, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, and you feed him for a lifetime. However, don't forget to teach him about the monopoly rights of the fishing industry, which is the obviously the base of the industrial side of this of this relationship. And let's have a look now at our region from this base superstructure perspective, as far as our coastline is concerned. Uh, waterways and offshore uh, 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 extractive industries have a long history in our region, uh, and. My question is, and we heard this already with respect to the Nile, with respect to wells, do waterways have religious identities? Is faith a place? And a lot of religious leaders would say so. And I would argue that this is the young Abraham, not the mature or the old Abraham. And we'll see in a moment what I mean by these, this juxtaposition of the two Abrahams. And that uh, the mature Abraham is the one we in our region should be working with. Um, here, the rule of law and the culture of impunity during the war of 2006 between Lebanon and, uh, and Israel. Uh, now, Lebanon, uh, Israel says this is a mistake, and uh, all of a sudden, when they destroy something, their bombing becomes very inaccurate. Uh, but they destroyed a refinery in the southern part of Lebanon and basically totally polluted the entire uh, coastline of Lebanon. Not to say that Lebanon does not do a lot to pollute its own coastline through corruption, but this was uh, during a war. This is the use of, of environmental destruction in the waterways uh, for war purposes. Uh, so we hear, let's move on now directly to, to Abraham. Abraham is told to leave his country, to leave, or his nation, to leave his family, and to leave his property, his father's house. And we'll see that these three issues, nation, property, and uh, family or clan are three core topics which still play a huge role in our region today and I would argue are uniquely not Abrahamic. 
Uh, now, we've so, supposedly solved our problem because now we have an agreement between Israel and Lebanon. And this logic, again, I would say is unique, uniquely not Abrahamic because it assumes that these regions have a religious identity, which I would say you can give it them, you can give it them these uh, waterways a religious identity, but it has nothing to do with the origins of our faith, which is up to you to decide. Um, so to understand this, again, we have to go back to the base superstructure uh, relationship. We have to follow the money trail. Eco the economic base feeds conflicts. It feeds conflicts between countries and within countries, uh, especially countries that are di as diverse uh, as Lebanon or Syria for that matter, or Iraq. Uh, our conflicts are contradictions inherently problematic. The Quran tells us that God made us different for a reason. Uh, and this reason is that we can better understand each other. Uh, as we all know the quote, right? So um, confessions and confessionalism is God given, is God will. <laughs> Our unique identities are something that God made us, uh, uh, gave us in order for us to become better human beings. When we, however, link our religious identities to spaces, to waterways, we go from confessionalism to sectarianism. And this is where humans basically pollute our, make, confessionalism toxic, which is my definition of sectarianism or muthabiya as opposed to taithiya. This, this uh, distinction I think is very important to understand our region. Now let's look at one of the examples of uh, attributed to Abraham. And this I think will make it clear what the young Abraham as opposed to the mature Abraham means. Uh, it's very clear this is the base superstructure relationship. The superstructure, which is ideas made by politicians are trying to influence uh, relationships on the ground. Now, is the, are the Abraham Accords even Abrahamic? <laughs> I would argue no. If we take the attempt to give these regions religious identities uh, as the Abraham Accords do, we add a fifth rider to the four riders of the apocalypse along with war, famine, pestilence, and death. We now have misinformation. Uh, so this is something that they're, that they're, they're definitely trying to pull on us, if you will, but we can look at the story of Abraham and realize where this is coming from. And to do that, we have to look at the entire region and we have to go from Abraham up to the present. So we have to look at the, the Mediterranean, the continental space, as opposed to the regional and local. And we have to look at the long durée, the long history from Abraham up to the present, especially because we are uh, uh, following this Abrahamic perspective. And I would just argue with the famous uh, physicist who was a teacher of Einstein's, Herman Minkowski, who said that if you don't follow the space-time continuum, you will literally not understand much. And I think this is where we can see a nice relationship between faith and science. So let's take this space-time continuum and Abraham who was promised that if he gave up on uh, his family, his property, and his nation, he would get a new nation as numerous as the stars. Well, this is the quote. I'm not going to read it for you. You can look it up. And this is, the, of course, the biblical uh, version. There's also a reference of a, of a different nature in the Quran. When Abraham finally gets his, uh, his promise is actually fulfilled, he misunderstands it. Now, first of all, the, I'm going to talk about the Isaacian confusion, which I think is not relevant, but it's important to point out. Is it Ishmael? Is it Isaac? I would argue for our purposes, it's irrelevant whether the son was Isaac or Ishmael. Uh, that's an Isaacian confusion with, as opposed to an Isaacian fallacy. Because what Abraham thinks once he gets his son is he's gonna found a great nation based on country and property and, 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 uh, and family or tribe. He wants to go back to the old Abraham and this thinking is what leads to the conflicts we have today. So allegorically, Abraham is told to kill the son, kill the source of the old thinking. And it's only when Abraham is willing to do this that we can actually move forward against the four riders of the ap apocalypse and go from this vicious cycle where we link religion and identity and property together to a virtuous one where we can have a higher power, whether it's God's will or, or rule of law and move on in our region. So when Abraham is willing to take this global loan today, is willing to sacrifice allegorically his son, he and follow God, he is able to uh, actually uh, get the nation that he wanted, which of course is the nation of the believers. Now, just as an aside, Isaac and Ishmael do get back together when Abraham dies and bury him, at least according 
to the New Testament, but that's the Old Testament, but that's a, a, a side story. Now, if we look at the three Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and, and Islam, do they offer us a way to turn natural resources into a source of coexistence instead of conflict? There are a lot of uh, documents for all three faiths. Uh, the most well-developed, and this is an advantage of having a pope, is uh, Laudato Si from the Vatican, but there are also very good Jewish and Islamic uh, documents of a similar nature at a similar time, working on water, working on the environment in general, and linking it to natural resources, which I will not go into. It. Now I'm just going to go into very briefly, because my time is running out, some concrete examples of what we're doing here in, in Lebanon and at our university. We have two ongoing projects, one funded by the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, which is the oil and gas project. And the second one is the political economy of sectarianism and coexistence funded by the um, Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights of the UN, uh, working on the role, working on a lot of different topics, but amongst them, the role of faith in being a foundation for dealing with toxic sectarianism and moving on to seeing uh, Conf uh, confessionalism as a source of coexistence. Um, so the first project, uh, the one on faith uh, and natural resources, we're trying to look at how religion, and this is something that in Lebanon, I was surprised, as you can probably hear, I'm not Lebanese. I'm, uh, I'm from the US, but my family is originally from Austria. Um, I was surprised at the level of anti- oh. We've lost you. Mm. That's a bit dramatic. That's a bit problem. <laughs> oh, sorry. So we can turn Eugene. Faith Eugene, sorry. Focusing Eugene, on... we... can you hear me? Yes. We lost you for about 10 or 15 seconds there. Can 10 or 15 just... seconds. So oh. I'm, I'm just talking Austria. about, right, I'm talking about how I was surprised to see how religion is also seen in our region often as a source of the problems that we have. And of course, when you link religion and space, it is a cause of a problem. But if we can use this from the mature Abrahamic approach instead of the early Abrahamic approach, I think we can solve a lot of problems. And here we're working concretely on the issue of oil and natural gas and the role of faith. And we're, we're linking it to examples where we see Christians and Muslims working together on this topic in Kenya, in Nigeria, and we hope to be working with um, Jewish organizations as well uh, to, because the offshore oil issue, as you probably know, is a, is a big one in Lebanon. And we share a border, uh, of course, with Israel, Palestine as well. Uh, this is, a, this is the, the kickoff. This was um, at the parliament. Uh, uh, and I, as a dean, we have, a, of course, a large uh, Shia population in Lebanon, and she's a Shia MP and her uh, her committee is for women and children. And here, the issue here was gender and oil and natural gas. But we continuously bring in the faith-based approach as well, being a Catholic university. And finally, this is the symbol of our political, political economy of uh, uh, sectarianism and coexistence project, where we bring in all the elements. And just to go back to the original question, the early Abraham sees religion, family, property linked to faith. The mature Abraham learns his lesson, allegorically sacrifices his son, which is seen in that context, in order to move from a culture of impunity based on power to submission to God, which is actually what Muslim means. Uh, and I think that this is really what we have to focus on here in the Wana region is moving from the early Abraham to the later Abraham, overcoming the Isaacian uh, fallacy. And the Isaac, the, excuse me, the Abraham Accords are a typical example of an abuse of the uh, story of Abraham uh, for very uh, problematic purposes. Thank you. Thank you.